Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the webinar series, the quarterly webinar series organized by uh, Seismic Academy, an initiative by Hilti India Private Limited. So the topic for the day, as you all know, is emerging technologies for earthquake resistance structures. And uh, through the session, we look to understand and gain more insight into the topics of base isolators and seismic dampers. We've ha we have two uh, extremely uh, well-known professionals from the industry today, Dr. Vasan Matsagar and Dr. Yogendra Singh, who will uh, deliberate on this topic. So before we start, meanwhile, I will just uh, quickly present my screen. And uh, sir, if you can just uh, confirm that the screen is visible. Yeah. All right. Uh, so before I hand it over to our extreme uh, our uh, guests and speakers for the day, I just like to uh, give a brief insight about the Seismic Academy and what this initiative basically entails for. So it is a, a forum of professionals, academicians, authorities and industry experts who come and interact and disseminate knowledge on various aspects related to earthquake engineering. They do this with uh, various stakeholders. The sole intent is to increase awareness and develop expertise on the topic. The Seismic Academy is an initiative by Hilti. And this was launched in India in 2019. The vision was very simple to make it as one source of information for all seismic initiatives in the country. While we have a lot of information uh, to always refer to, but then we also uh, need a kind of a central uh, repository or a database. So the primary objective was to engage in uh, awareness initiatives like webinars, collaborative events like workshops with uh, academics and with uh, association partners as well as with the industry, uh, selectively undertake R&D with academic partners based on the most relevant topics, uh, generate publications and uh, highlighting the initiatives and different uh, key topics related to the aspect and eventually build up a central database or a repository to collect and capture all such events, initiatives and publications of the country. We have been extremely uh, fortunate to have a very strong advisory board who have always been the uh, guide, uh, who have always guided us uh, to define the roadmap, define the right set of activities and uh, based on their guidance, we have always detailed out on a plan which we want to drive and through which we want to also create a sustainable impact. The first one was creating and modifying and giving insights and inputs to the development of national standards of the country, uh, keeping in mind the changing needs of the industry. Create and reinforce partnership with different associations wherein we can also get to interact with more practicing engineers, more academicians, courses, trainings, awareness initiatives like webinars, workshops, conference, modules, publications, identify gaps and challenges and also define research initiatives to address the gaps and these challenges. So that is the holistic view with which the academy was created and how we want to create an impact out of it. Over the last two, two and a half years, uh, we have taken long strides. Uh, yes, uh, we, I say two and a half years because immediately after the inception, it was also kind of uh, impacted by the COVID and uh, not much could be done. But over the last two and a half years, we engaged in webinars, publications, workshops, research projects, journals, as well as the annual conferences. We have an independent website, which also gives you an overview of what all activities are there. And uh, it is uh, it is always available to everyone to go and refer to. Through the webinars, we have been able to engage a lot of external national and international experts. You can see who have come and shared their expertise, shared their knowledge through this platform for us to learn and also explore future opportunities. We touch best on the important topics like importance of earthquake in healthcare facilities, importance of uh, seismic resilient infrastructure in hilly regions, seismic retrofitting, understanding the a uh, new standard on steel structure designs, which is IS18168, delivered by the experts. We also have trimester publications which capture the current affairs in the field of seismic engineering. And we have eminent engineers and authors who have taken the initiative to also contribute their, with their expertise on this topic. 
through this trimester journals we have also captured pertinent topics including the revision of different codes like 1893 16700 and also relevant topics we could also gain insights from diverse and key stakeholders of the industry which also includes bureau of indian standards the ed of bmtpc and many more we have collaborated with bodies like national institute of disaster management the dtma from 2022 to drive the capacity building activities for delhi government department we continued this with bmtpc nidm bis and ddma in 2023 wherein we had more than 50 senior professionals and executives across the country who came and joined this workshop we continued this again in 2024 in the month of march and again it was a very good in success wherein we could capture the perspectives of different government professionals as well as practice engineers and academicians through this now why when we say it's an academy it cannot also go i mean we cannot also leave uh, behind the students so we have taken the initiative to reach out to different institutes and organize workshops and awareness programs for different students wherein we have involved different experts from the industry as well we have also developed an online module on earthquake engineering it has been a basic module and the future modules are work in progress it has been developed by professor yogendra singh who is also one of the speakers for the day and we undertook a research project uh, with iit roorkee earthquake engineering department in collaboration with them to understand the seismic safety of non structural elements overall we have been able to reach more than 2500 people through our different initiatives 17 webinars more than 10 workshops conferences modules journals and we have been able to create an impact but i can say uh, this is a very first step uh, with this we also organized uh, two annual conferences and we were joined by the stalwarts of the industry and last year it was also a theme based uh, topic wherein we wanted to drive the seismic safety of healthcare facilities yes this is a very a starting step and uh, we all uh, we all will require your support and your encouragement to take this forward please join us through our conferences webinars workshops contribute your uh, with your own expertise in the form of different articles case studies be a lighthouse and be a subject matter in the expert to take this to more and more people and be an advocate to spread the message and help create awareness this is an initiative which we have started we are in the early stages and we for sure will need you with this i come to the topic for the day which is imaging technologies of earthquake uh, for earthquake resilience and i hereby introduce the first speaker for the day uh, i don't think uh, he needs any introduction dr vasan matsagar he is the current head of the department of civil engineering department from iit delhi and he is also one of the advisory board members of our own seismic academy a very brief introduction about him uh, he is a dogra chair professor and head department of civil engineering at iit delhi he has uh, developed innovative technologies uh, and some of which uh, are copyrighted and uh, patented and he has been publishing more than 100 international journals and papers several international conference manuscripts books edited uh, eight edited proceedings and has two patents and one copyright he has served as a member of the national building code of india and is currently serving on code development committees in the bis irc and iso uh, he is also serving as the editor in chief of the iset journal and the indian concrete journal and he is a recipient of numerous national and international recognitions so with this i hand it over to you uh, sir you can uh, share your screen and uh, uh, over to you sir Thank you, Shona. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope my screen is visible to all. Yes, sir. It is perfectly visible. Okay. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Seismic Academy for giving me this opportunity to talk about the uh, latest developments in the area of earthquake resistant design of structures uh, and to talk about the emerging technologies for earthquake resilience. Uh, there are two parts of this presentation. Uh, the second one will be taken care by Professor uh, Yogendra Singh from IIT Roorkee. 
on different kinds of dampers and the first one uh, I will look a little bit into the base isolation systems. I'll give you an uh, overview obviously within uh, a short duration of about 30 minutes or so it might not be uh, possible to cover all the um, nuances of base isolation uh, there is almost one semester course on base isolation as well as uh, the passive and semi-active active response control systems most of which we have covered in one of the books published in uh, crc press on passive vibration control of structures uh, nonetheless, I will give some uh, tenets of base isolation system and how it is being implemented, particularly in the Indian context and what are the latest developments therein. So my talk will revolve around the need for base isolation and how the code developments have happened within India and at international standards organization and then what kind of structures we are building currently and what is our future course. Uh, obviously, during this process, I will also talk about some academic research and patents developed uh, in India on base isolation system. On your screen right now, you see some of the patents uh, of the isolation systems or base isolators or bearings that were already granted and some of them are now being commercialized. To put it in a context, uh, I wanted to have this categorization known to you that there are different kinds of vibration control systems which are categorized into passive, semi-active, active and hybrid kind of uh, systems. Out of this, uh, today in this first presentation, uh, the focus will be though mainly on the base isolation system. With this, uh, uh, it is always provided the isolation systems are always provided with some kind of uh, addi additional devices and therefore in most cases base isolation systems are hybrid kind of systems wherein there is more than one type of controller provided nonetheless the other controllers are typically in order to control the damping or the large displacements and therefore it doesn't require a separate discussion it can be considered along with the base isolation system therefore my focus will remain on the isolation systems or the seismic base isolation devices for those who are absolutely new to base isolation i'll quickly give you an idea about what base isolation system is it typically helps to make the structure flexible and we understand in structural dynamics that anything that is flexible has a longer time period it means the shorter frequency or lower frequency and thereby it uh, has higher displacement and its behavior is somewhat similar or comparable to that of the trees and we know that during earthquakes trees doesn't fall or they do not receive damage but the stiff structures they do and thereby this idea of making the structure flexible is more attractive obviously because of this change in the frequency content of the structure uh, makes it less vulnerable to earthquakes because the frequency contents of the earthquakes are now uh, different than the frequency content or the model frequencies of the structure and because of that resonance is avoided in order to uh, make this possible uh, we incorporate the base isolation system below the structure so that the entire structure is isolated from the shaking ground and the time period of the structure is elongated or lengthened and in addition to that there is significant amount of energy dissipation here in different forms whether it is in the form of uh, viscous damping or in the form of friction damping because of all this, uh, there is significant reduction in the structural response in terms of superstructure acceleration, in terms of the drift, story drift within the structure. And there are significant amount of advantages that we gain by incorporating the base isolation system. We typically compare the response with the conventional technologies where we try to strengthen the members. However, in case of base isolation system, we completely isolate the structure and therefore strengthening of the members uh, for earthquake resistance is not required. And therefore, this design is also called as the uh, a seismic design of the ice, uh, base isolated structure. So the typical sequence of construction includes the construction of foundation, then installation of the isolation system, on top of which typically we provide a base raft and the superstructure is built as usual but a seismically it means uh, seismic forces does not de govern their design and then during the earthquake as you can see 
the most of the deformations are concentrated at the isolation level where the superstructure remains mostly unaffected because of the earthquake ground motion digging a little bit deeper uh, into gaining an insight into how base isolation works if we see our response spectrum typically if it is uh, a conventional structure without any base isolation then if its time period is in this zone where the, where the spectral acceleration values or base shear are quite high because of the isolation system and its flexibility elongation of the time period or lengthening of the time period the time period increases significantly it means the structure becomes more flexible and thereby the spectral acceleration ordinates reduces down considerably and this reduction can be as high as 50 percent or 60 percent and thereby the design of the columns is mainly governed by the dead load light load combinations and other load combinations rather than earthquake load combination however we know that uh, whenever there is a flexibility introduced in the structure there is additional cost that we have to pay in terms of more displacements and in order to reduce down those displacement or control that displacement response we keep on increasing the damping whereas in our conventional structure damping is of the order of two percent to five percent depending on whether it is steel structure or whether it is uh, cracked concrete structure, in case of base isolation system, damping could be as high as 10 to 15 percent, depending on what kind of material is used. Thereby, we control the uh, acceleration, we control the base shear, we control the sizing forces in the structure on one hand, and on the other hand, we control the displacement response of the structure. This uh, is achieved by using different kinds of base isolation system, which is the focus of the talk today. What are the different kinds of base isolation systems that are used in practice and that are innovated and that are upcoming? Out of all this, the most commonly used isolation system is lead rubber bearing system, which is one of the elastomeric type of isolation system in which there is rubber isolate rubber uh, layers in the isolator and there are some steel shims so that because of the huge vertical pressure, there is no bulging of the isolation system. There is another kind of isolation system which is friction, uh, which is based on friction, and those are quite popular in the uh, western coast of the United States, where earthquake is quite earthquakes are quite prominent, and it helps in uh, decoupling the structure from the shaking ground. So, in case of flexible building, uh, whereas there are significant amount of seismic forces induced in the structure because of the base isolation structure does not receive those forces so it works something similar to a pendulum and therefore the name is derived as friction pendulum system where again the time period depends on what kind of curvature that has been provided and because of this the structure is completely decoupled and it does not uh, receive any ground shaking from the sh uh, shaking ground during the earthquake the advantage of the uh, sliding isolation system over the Elastomeric isolation system is the reduction in the torsional coupling or because of the asymmetry. Asymmetry happens in the structure because of not matching the center of mass and center of resistance. But because in the isolation system based on the friction forces, the friction force is independent of the earthquake excitation of frequency content that is developed at the base of the building and proportional to the mass of the building. The center of mass and center of rigidity they coincide and because of that the torsional response significantly reduces down because the center of mass and center of rigidity they almost coincide it is to be noted that typically in a base isolation structure we use more than one type of isolation system and this helps in economizing the entire base isolation uh, systems that we invest in uh, for example we use the, some of the bearings having restoring capability in the form of elastomeric isolation system and some of the rest of the isolation systems are provided in the form of sliders which are relatively much cheaper as compared to elastomeric bearing apart from these conventional isolation system some of the new systems are being developed that provides more advantages as compared to the conventional isolation system what we see here is some uh, one of the uh, patented isolation system developed at IIT Delhi in which bidirectional uh, means multidirectional earthquake excitation in horizontal plane are controlled by using different kinds of uh, restoring springs uh, the conventionally we use the cylindrical 
springs however here in this isolation system conical springs are introduced and those conical springs could be tapering from outside or tapering towards inside or tapering on both sides thereby we get a larger non-linearity in the response of the structure or in the force deformation loop and the energy dissipation happens at the friction contact uh, at these five points this system is uh, now being introduced to isolate some of the industrial equipment uh, and it is very useful for the lightweight structures. This has been tested on the shake table and it has been found that it helps in reducing down the dynamic response of the structure by almost about 35%. Obviously, it depends on what kind of friction surface and the conical springs have been designed. In addition to that, the advantage of the system is during the service life of the structure, we can change the level of isolation that can be achieved depending on what are the dynamic properties of the structure and how it changes over a period of time. Another kind of isolation system that have been uh, introduced uh, in um, isolating different kinds of equipment in particular are the oblate spheroid base isolation system in which an oblate spheroid ball is inserted between the superstructure and substructure and during the earthquake ground shaking this isolation system this ball it rotates and obviously because of the gravitational acceleration it has a tendency to come back to its original position and there is energy dissipation in rolling friction again this kind of system is very simple and in uh, developing countries use of this isolation system is very convenient Patents have been filed as to what kind of design of this isolator should be, how the minor axis and major axis should be designed in order to achieve the higher level of uh, higher level of isolation with the restoring capability. Again, shake table tests have been conducted and it, has, it was seen that the optimization of the minor and major axis of this oblate spheroid help us in achieving the restoring and isolation both simultaneously because otherwise both of them are contradictory in nature. If we see the uh, seismic zonation map uh, that was introduced earlier, uh, we have a total of four zones uh, starting from zone two to zone five. And out of that, uh, zone five experiences a significant amount of earthquake activity with high intensity. And in these zones, typically the healthcare facilities need to be functional during and after an earthquake. And base isolation provides an excellent alternative for that purpose over the conventional earthquake resistant design technologies however if we see the uh, newer uh, the uh, the newly introduced zones there are five zones now and you can see the most of the northern part of india is in now severe most earthquake zone and thereby again these areas uh, they do mandate that the newer technologies are to be introduced particularly to the lifeline structures such as hospital buildings in this sector in order to ensure their continued performance that means seismic performance level should be operational it means those uh, facilities those healthcare facilities hospitals should remain operational during and after an earthquake and uh, base isolation gives an uh, alternative in order to provide that operational level of seismic performance Earlier, uh, most of the buildings designed and constructed in India using base isolation were based on the international course. However, now the Bureau of Indian Standards Civil Engineering Division 39 Committee has introduced Part 6 of the 1893 or 1893 code, which is for criteria for acquisition design of structures. In addition, there are some dampers uh, introduced in the IS 1893 Part 7 for even equipment and piping system because in the healthcare sector, again, we do make use of uh, some of these damping devices, uh, though that is not part of my presentation today. So my focus will still remain on the design of base isolated structures using the codal provisions. However, the codal provisions are again based on how the behavior of the base isolated structure is. And we can see that the behavior of the isolated structure is drastically different from the conventional fixed base structure. Whereas in the conventional fixed base structure, the superstructure acts or the uh, overall building acts in a cantilever mode. In case of the isolation system, it is in the isolation mode such that the superstructure almost remains rigid and there are hardly any deformations in the superstructure, particularly in the first mode, which is the lowest mode uh, corresponding to the lowest frequency. 
which is also called isolation mode there is hardly any drift on the superstructure and that makes uh, it is possible that the entire energy dissipation or most of the energy dissipation is at the isolation level and hardly any energy is passed on to the superstructure therefore the design of the superstructure is assessed if we carry out the stress analysis study for the superstructure both in the longitudinal means longer direction of the isolated building and the shorter direction we see that because of the introduction of the isolation system at the base the significant amount of uh, stress is reduced in the superstructure uh, both in the uh, longer and shorter direction of the structure so these are the significant benefits of uh, introduction of the isolation system in the structure course typically talk about different approaches for design analysis and design of the base isolated structure and they are divided into dynamic and equivalent static analysis however before we conduct those dynamic or equivalent uh, lateral force procedures which are similar to the seismic coefficient method in 1893 part 1 we have to conduct static analysis in order to design primarily the isolation systems once that is done then we conduct either uh, the dynamic analysis using response spectrum or the time history uh, detailed nonlinear time history analysis or the equivalent of the seismic coefficient method such as the equivalent lateral force procedure which even part 6 of is 1893 talks about in the response spectrum method uh, as we understand we have a single degree of freedom system within which the isolation system is typically highly nonlinear however we may use a equivalent bilinear system in order to simplify the analysis procedure so we develop the response spectrum and then we find out corresponding to the time period uh, that we have decided to elongate what are the uh, pseudo acceleration or the shear forces that we have to design for and what is the corresponding displacement in order to make sure that the serviceability criteria is met obviously with this equivalent linear direction uh, comes some approximations and some disadvantages also but as compared to the other conventional technologies for application design this is still far better comparatively if we carry out the time history analysis uh, we will be requiring a time history which is site specific and that is dependent on what kind of uh, ground strata is available and how the site specific earthquakes are possible at that location so we develop some artificial earthquake time histories uh, for given uh, damping and the uh, location and then after that we conduct non linear time history analysis where the isolation systems are highly non linear and the multi degree of freedom system model is developed for the isolation system subjected to this earthquake ground motion and from that we find out as to what is the response of the structure in terms of acceleration and displacement and find out what are the seismic demands on the lateral load resisting system and typically they are extremely low as compared to the conventional fixed base structures the isolation system uh, is typically designed for the design displacement which we uh, limit so that there is no overrun and if there is overrun we give some control system in order to make sure that the design displacement is maintained at least during the maximum credible earthquake if we see the international course particularly that from japan uh, wherein there are large number of base as well building already constructed even taller buildings it is specified as to in which case the Uh, detailed structural analysis is required and whether we have to follow response spectrum analysis or time analysis depends on what kind of uh, base isolated building that we are constructing it is to be noted that uh, even high rise mid rise to high rise buildings are also base isolated in the other parts of the world in india yet we are not uh, going uh, to that high level for base isolation typically for a uh, high rise building the time period is already quite long so we may not uh, necessarily require base isolation but for low rise to mid rise buildings isolation remains quite effective now the question comes as to at what location this isolation system should be provided and indian standard code does talk about uh, the importance of deciding the location of the base isolation system there are various alternatives as to where those isolation systems are to be provided whether it is in the basement uh with a story at the basement level uh, below that uh, constructing the 
rough slab and then um, the isolators below that or just above the columns of the basement floor or even in the uh, superstructure above the ground floor columns. All this has advantages and disadvantages, but we have to mention here that there has to be a gap, gap maintained between the isolation system and the surrounding structure so that isolation remains effective. Again, the choice here remains with the uh, designer and typically for a given structure, we, we see as to what are the advantages and disadvantages of the location of the isolation system. Even the choice of the isolation system, whether it can be a conventional elastomeric isolation system or new type of sliding system also becomes important. And of course, costs uh, are also equally important. Typically, sliding isolation systems are cheaper than the elastomeric systems. Even for an existing structure, uh, we can use base isolation to base isolate the existing, uh, for example, reinforced concrete structure without even affecting the superstructure or without even stopping the use of the structure during the retrofitting process. Though uh, this is uh, in itself a separate topic and maybe we will discuss this sometimes later. However, uh, its practical implementation, particularly in the Indian context, is still in the nascent stage. Uh, whereas, uh, if we see the other parts of the seismically prone countries, a number of base isolated buildings have already come up, and particularly hospital buildings are base isolated. Whereas in India, the number is still in uh, only up to, up to a dozen. So I'll quickly give a glimpse of what are the current status of the uh, base isolated buildings constructed in India. The uh, first facility of uh, in healthcare was in uh, Bhuj, Gujarat, where the base facility building was constructed. But of late, some new buildings are coming up. For example, the Indira Gandhi Hospital uh, at Dwarka in New Delhi is base isolated. The uh, Police Bhavan uh, in Patna, Bihar, the Sardar Patel Bhavan has been base isolated. It also houses the Bihar State uh, Disaster Management Authority. And there are some other healthcare facilities coming up with base isolation. One of the requirements in the um, police headquarters building in Patna, Bihar, was that its, its uh, seismic performance should be at operational level. And then obviously, base isolation came very handy for ensuring that, particularly also because uh, this building houses the Bihar State Disaster Management Authority in Patna. And thereby, uh, almost about 440 base isolation systems of different kinds were introduced in the structure so that economy is also achieved. And as I was discussing previously, the location of the isolation system was suitably designed such that the substructure is designed a little bit more rigidly and the superstructure flexibly so that we achieve the higher effectiveness of the base isolation system. Another structure. Um, that incorporates this kind of isolation system is the uh, the uh, hospital buildings in Dwarka Hospital, one of the largest healthcare facilities using the isolation system. And again, here, uh, one of the challenges was the isolation system was uh, provided above the basement uh, floor level and the working space was not available. You can see the uh, architect's view of this building and during the construction all these blocks are seen to be uh, using the base isolation. The 750 bed hospital building in Dwarka is now fully functional with all these isolation system in place uh, making sure that operational level of seismic performance achieved in this base isolated building constructed uh, in India and now uh, functional. Another hospital building in Srinagar which is currently in construction. It is an extension ward of government uh, Lalade Hospital or LD Hospital in Srinagar. During uh, the uh, 2014 flooding, you can see the level of uh, water level was quite high and therefore it was deliberated as to what location the isolation system should be. So the isolation system themselves are not uh, affected because of the flood. However, we can imagine that the moat width or the surrounding gap provided may get uh, flooded or may uh, get obstructed because of some debris uh, during the earthquake and therefore it was decided that the isolation level should be provided such that it doesn't get affected or the isolation is not stopped because of accumulation of those debris 
and still the operational level of seismic performance is achieved. Several combinations were tried uh, and recommended in the structure uh, for uh, isolating the ground plus six story reinforced concrete structure. This uh, structure is currently under construction. However, seeing that uh, still base isolation is yet to achieve the popularity amongst the uh, designers and practitioners, a demonstration building was decided to be constructed in association with IIT Delhi. So in this, the objective was to showcase the base isolation technology for operational level of performance during the earthquake and also protection of the secondary systems or equipment uh, or installations in the structures, which can be easily achieved in case of base isolation structure as compared to the conventional fixed base structure, where the occupants and contents can be very well protected by using this kind of base isolation system. So in this uh, building, uh, a new novel type of base isolation system, which is called double curvature uh, sliding system was used rather than the uh, lead rubber uh, bearing. This is uh, located in zone four of the seismic zoning map of the structure to showcase the base isolation technology to academia and industry. Relatively, uh, this is a, this building is having a shorter uh, or smaller footprint, and you can see the sectional elevation uh, of this building. And these uh, blue rectangles show the location of the isolation system. Uh, when this building was uh, conceived, uh, we have analyzed and designed this building. The Indian Standard Code Part 6 was not available. Therefore, we have used the uh, US code for its design. And we have used the combination of the course, which is typically discouraged during design of the structures. So in this case, the substructure was designed as a special moment resting frame structure, whereas the superstructure is designed for uh, as an uh, ordinary moment resting frame design. At that time, uh, we have used the response reduction factors as five and three for the structure below and above, means substructure and superstructure. In this case, the time period elongation was quite significant. Uh, its counterpart fixed base building uh, was estimated to have a time period of over 0.44 seconds, whereas the base assay structure was having almost the 3.6 as time period, thereby the period enhancement was about 8.5. Rest of the details are quite uh, straightforward, similar to our conventional uh, constructions. This period elongation was achieved uh, by using the isolation system inserted at these different locations, as you can see here. In this case, uh, there was a lift veil uh, to be designed as base isolated so that the entire structure remains base isolated without any compromise, and thereby we have decisively made sure that the isolation systems are also provided uh, at the lift core so that lift core doesn't obstruct the uh, isolation effectiveness. So we have provided the gap, the lift core was hung, as well as the isolation system was provided on the pedestal so that it can be seen. And in addition to that, in order to replace the isolated system, if it requires during the life, uh, during the service life of the structure, we have made sure that some Arrangement is provided to put the jacks here so that we can jack up the structure, release the reaction on the isolator, remove the isolator, put the new one, and then again transfer the reaction of the superstructure towards the substructure through the isolation system. Now, these detailing uh, are provided such that the degree of uh, freedom associated with the isolation also corresponds to one of the floor levels so that there is no requirement of additional floor to be constructed just in order to make sure that the isolation remains effective. As I have said, we have used the double curvature uh, friction pendulum system in this case, uh, for which the ideal force deformation look might look like this. However, in this case, uh, we have made some additional provisions for overrun. Means if the design displacement is reached, then this additional energy dissipation is achieved by yielding of the uh, bolts provided between these two connections where they are provided in the form of aluminum nut bolts. The actual isolation system looks like this. There are two types of isolators used with different um, with, with different planar dimension and providing different effective uh, stiffness and effective damping. 
Now, in this structure, there are two types of such isolation systems used in the two corners. And obviously, because it is a sliding isolation system, the uh, torsional coupling is uh, quite minimal because the reactions, they match uh, even when uh, the structure has been displaced on the isolation system. In this, we have also tried to see what is the effect of the equivalent linearization for the nonlinear force deformation curve. So the actual nonlinear force deformation curve uh, idealized as a bilinear one can be seen like this. However, we have also seen what is the effect of the K effective on this. And we, see, we have seen that for practical purposes, it's all right to have the K effective and C effective for designing the structure, which we tried to explain to the designers not only through the theoretical calculations but also on the site as to how it functions so there were a number of uh, meetings conducted on the site to showcase this technology and how the base isolation systems are provided on the structure how they are installed on different column levels and then how we build the superstructure in this case uh, we have also seen uh, that the isolation system uh, makes sure that not only the superstructure remains operational, but the substructure also helps in making sure that operational level of seismic performance is achieved. So this is the procedure through which uh, we have gone through in the structure, where the superstructure and substructure is completely isolated, even at the staircase level and lift core level. For example, at the staircase, you can see that the flight above separated from the flight below by a gap as well as the railings are provided uh, with some gaps so that isolation remains effective and it is not obstructed during the operation of the building the lift core is also separated uh, and some additional architectural features are required at the motwit so that at the isolation plane the functionality of the building is maintained however the seismic isolation is not affected even the services that are provided in the structure are provided with flexible connections so that displacement of about 300 plus or minus uh, are accommodated within that including the mechanical electrical and plumbing services in the structure one of the concerns uh, that uh, that remains in the minds of the constructors developers builders and the decision makers is that uh, the cost effectiveness of isolation system might not be as high it might require additional expenses and therefore here in this structure we have carried out the cost effective analysis and it has been found that in general the cost is uh, hardly exceeding below five to six percent in this particular structure where the isolation systems were imported uh, from other country therefore the isolation systems were costly However, if the isolation systems are indigenously made, there is a quite likelihood that the conventional fixed base structure cost and the base isolation building structure cost will remain almost comparable. The reason being that the superstructure elements are now designed aseismically, means the earthquake load combination does not govern anymore. Of course, for slab, it doesn't matter. But for the lateral load resisting elements, for the foundation and for the beams, the, uh, there is significant reduction in the seismic force or in the demand, and thereby the capacities need not to be as high. So we have carried out this cost analysis, and you can see that there is reduction in the cost of the beams, columns, and foundation, uh, and there is some additional cost in the form of isolation system. Now, obviously, here we have not talked about the uh, performance but if we have to achieve the similar performance uh, again uh, base isolation becomes more effective as compared to uh, other conventional techniques we have also looked into what are the investments made in uh, in making the concrete or in the steel and again it is found that base isolations remain effective however in order to achieve the operational level of seismic performance for the conventional uh, uh, techniques it becomes very challenging particularly for controlling the drift and acceleration limits as compared to base isolation so we have carried out a detailed investigation as to what is the material wise cost estimate for the fixed base and isolated structure and what kind of performance is achieved and still uh, having said all this uh, the cost escalation is not more than about six percent or so now, if you would like to achieve a similar level of effectiveness in terms of seismic response reduction, 
if we redesign our conventional structure then there is significant increase in the cost of the conventional structures particularly if we have to control the interstory drift as you can see here for drift control structure the escalation in the cost of the fixed base structure is more than 25 percent as compared to the base isolated structure which can be very easily achieved in case of base isolation system we have used uh, the fema based benefit cost um, uh, approach for seeing the effectiveness or cost effectiveness of the base size structure over the fixed base structure and it has been found that the benefit cost ratio is almost about 2.5 in case of base isolated structure i will summarize some of the existing structures uh, first of course to start with uh, a research based or academic study on how base isolation is effective how we can replace the isolation system in the um, base isolated building during its operation as well as how the secondary system works so this was for the demonstration purpose and later on there were number of uh, systems developed in the structure to ensure that the effectiveness of base isolation uh, remains as compared to the conventional isolation uh, conventional fixed base structures as compared to the base isolated one I have already talked about the Bush hospital building built after 2001 earthquake event there are other uh, few structures which are built using base isolation system. For example, the Guru Tegh Bahadur Hospital project in Delhi is with base isolation. The uh, Lok Naik Jay Prakash Narayan Hospital building in New Delhi is again with uh, base isolation systems provided at the basement level. In Himachal Pradesh, Walker Military Hospital project is provided with lead rubber bearing. Uh, this is again one of the classical project where the healthcare facilities have been made operational. One of the latest developments in the base isolated healthcare facilities is in Dibrugod and Tezpur and few more hospital buildings are coming up in Northeast which is the severe most seismic zone uh, in India. Most of them are now base isolated to ensure their operational level of seismic performance. Data center needs to remain operational during and after earthquake uh, for disaster uh, response. We do require these data centers to be functional. Most of our activities these days are based on mobile network and network needs to be remain functional. And therefore, some of these buildings are provided with the isolation system. So this is one such example of IRO business park project in Gurugram where uh, the similar double curvature friction failure systems have been provided to ensure operational level of performance of the base isolated building. Another project which is currently ongoing in Mumbai are using a very different kind of isolation system which are based on the spring, uh, spring isolation system and dashboard separately in two uh, distinct units and uh, very soon this building will be operational. So with that I will quickly conclude uh, my talk here today. The field implementation of base isolation is not uh, as uh, rapid as it is in the other developing countries uh, which are seismically prone but gradually it is picking up uh, there is a need to educate the, all the stakeholders for uh, these kind of advanced technologies and today uh, is one of the efforts in the same direction and we have seen that the cost effectiveness can be achieved if we are making these kind of devices indigenously in our Indian context. So with that, I uh, conclude my talk and I'll be glad if there are any questions and I am open for discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think in a brief uh, period of time, I think precisely 35 minutes, you have effectively covered a very uh, holistic uh, view of this uh, technology. And uh, for sure, there is uh, there are a lot of uh, information available and we, we have to go and learn for sure on that. Uh, I mean, uh, the way you highlighted on the different applications and specifically where these base isolated systems should be located or can be located depending on the type of building was also a, a very insightful theory. And then uh, you rightly mentioned the fact that while we take a lot of uh, protection on the overall building structure, then non-structural elements are also something that contributes to a huge percentage of the project. So while we isolate the building, we are somewhere also able to safeguard these uh, non-structural elements and uh, save the occupants of the building from facing some uh, unforeseen hazards. Uh, and the 
reference to IS 1893 Part 6, I think uh, it will also give uh, give our participants a lot of uh, motivation to go and refer to the code because BIS is working super actively in developing a lot of standards with respect to the latest technologies, and this is one such incident. Uh, and the examples you and the examples are uh, very real time examples like the hospital projects, the Bihar Police Bhavan, the examples in North East, the data center examples. These are uh these are exceptionally good examples and the work which we have carried out and thank you of course for sharing the uh, or giving a clearing the air about the misconception that exists that with new technologies the cost keeps on increasing and that's where your cost benefit analysis was also uh, a very uh, very insightful uh, part to that so thank you so much uh, for your uh, uh, deliberation sir there are a few questions in the chat box maybe we'll take the questions at the end of the session or meanwhile you can also uh, have a look at it and if you want to type your answers uh, you can also do that that also works with this i would like to introduce uh, the sp second speaker for the day i think again he also needs no introduction professor yogan rushing from iit Roorkee, department of earthquake engineering uh, just a couple of minutes i will take uh, he is the current professor and former head of the department of earthquake engineering at iit Roorkee. Uh, and his research interest uh, spans over performance-based design of buildings and bridges, the seismic response ev evaluation of structures, nonlinear modeling, uh, seismic evaluation and retrofitting of hospitals and schools, vulnerability and risk evaluation, and uh, the list is uh, pretty long. He has to his kitty more than 100 national and international publications and has been instrumental in the development of different standards in the country under CD39 of BIS, he also played a pivotal role in the development of the CPWD Handbook on Repair and Rehabilitation. He has been an expert member of different initiatives under the NDMA and NITM for seismic vulnerability study and developing different uh, policies of the country and has been conferred with different prestigious awards over his illustrious career. So, sir, over to you for the second exciting part of the webinar. Thank you, Mr. Mitra. So, I will share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, sir. You have to just put it in full screen, sir. You have to change yeah. the view. Yeah, I will change. Display settings you have to change, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so it's perfect, sir. Perfect, sir. Okay. So thank you very much for joining and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mutra, for introduction. So uh, in the previous talk, Professor Matsagar very nicely presented one um, set of the new technologies that is base isolation and uh, how we can use base isolation for enhancing performance. So we will talk now about using our dampers and uh, whether it is base isolation or damper, we have to take into account the characteristics of ground motion. So uh, if you look at the ground motion record, a typical ground motion record, which is something like this. So generally we record uh, ground motions using an accelerograph and this is record of the acceleration. We can convert this into velocity by integrating. And if we double integrate it, we can convert into uh, displacement. So what you see from here, this acceleration causes an inertia force. So inertia force we know from our high school physics that it is a fictitious force and uh, that force is causing damage to our structure and if we want to reduce that damage what comes to our mind is uh, we reduce the force acting on the structure and this force depends also on the period of the structure so period of a structure plays an important role and uh, we manipulate the period in base isolation to reduce the forces acting uh, on the structure we can also have uh, another angle of looking at earthquake so which if you see here this uh, acceleration is changing its direction very rapidly within a fraction of second it is it is changing the direction and this is imparting an energy to the structure and the structure has to dissipate that energy at a same rate at which it is being received uh, by the structure from the earthquake. So uh, base isolation 
uh, works like a detuning mechanism by which the flow of the energy into the structure is reduced and the structure has to dissipate less energy and the structure normally can dissipate energy only through damage so if the structure has to dissipate less energy uh, it will undergo less damage and that's what we want uh, in enhanced performance of the structure during earthquake the other way in which we can help the structure is by providing some supplemental devices to dissipate the energy and if those supplemental devices those are dissipating the energy, major share of the energy, then the structure again will have to uh, dissipate less energy and it has to undergo less damage. So this concept we are using in energy dissipation devices. So our conventional design process which we are using currently is like this, that we estimate the hazard, this blue line gives the hazard, then based on the energy dissipation capacity of the structure alone, so based on the ductility of the structure, it has certain energy dissipation capacity which depends upon the size of the hysteretic loop which the structure can form and uh, taking that into account, we can reduce the applied force by a factor which we call response reduction factor. So we reduce these forces by this factor and then we apply certain partial factor of safety in our design. So actual capacity of the structure which is shown by this curve is higher than what we are designing for and this difference between the actual capacity and the one which we have designed for we call over strength factor so this over strength factor is coming from the design method because we are using limited state design in limited state design we are using some partial factor of safety on material and we are using characteristic strength in place of uh, the mean strength or most probable strength that's why there is an over strength. So this is over strength, but even with this over strength, the capacity of the structure is much less than the actual force which will be applied on the structure if it is not getting damage or it is not dissipating energy. So naturally, the structure is bound to get damaged. If we want to avoid that damage, we have to either go for base isolation or for supplemental energy dissipation. So those structures like hospital buildings where we don't want the structure to undergo damage, we have to use one or both. Many times we use both the uh, technologies together. So this can also be explained with the shape of the response spectrum. So response spectrum has this peculiar shape. Initially the spectral acceleration is increasing, then it becomes flat and then it is decreasing in proportion to 1 upon t. So it is inversely proportional to the period. So somehow if I elongate the period, this period shift we can avoid through base isolation so we can see that the spectral acceleration and hence the forces acting on the structure are going to reduce but if you look on the displacement this is the displacement spectrum so the displacement is going to increase but most of this displacement will occur within the bearing as was shown by the animation uh, by Professor uh, Matsagar. So most of the displacement is occurring in the bearings and bearings are designed, specifically designed for that displacement. So it has no uh, harmful effect on the structure. The displacement within the structure, the interstory drift within the structure is reduced. On the other hand, if we are talking about supplemental energy dissipation, the so supplemental energy dissipation is acting like added damping. And the effect of the damping on response spectrum is shown here. If I go on increasing the damping, 5% is the uh, conventionally uh, considered damping in our structures in uh, case of uh, RCC. And 10% we consider in the masonry structures. And if we increase it further using some additional damping to 20%, the response spectrum will go on reducing. And here you can see that at any given period, we are not changing the period of the structure. So at any given period, the response of the structure and hence the forces acting on the structure are reducing. And this effect of the additional damping is not only there on acceleration, similar effect is there on the displacement also. So you can see that the displacement is also reducing and as a result, the interstory drift is also reducing. So with the help of dampers, or the supplemental energy dissipation devices also our objective is to reduce the force acting on the structure and also the interstory drift and in addition to that we also reduce the 
accelerations acting at the floor level. So non-structural components are of two types. One, what we call acceleration sensitive, like equipment uh, capped at the floor. So that is acceleration sensitive, that can get damaged if the floor acceleration is much higher. And we have drift sensitive non-structural components. The damage to these components depends upon the drift. So here we are controlling all the three. We are controlling the forces acting on the structure. So the structural performance improves, the damage to the components of the structure is reduced. The acceleration sensitive components are safeguarded because of the reduction in the acceleration and the drift sensitive uh, components are also safeguarded due to reduction in the drift. Now, how this energy dissipation can be achieved? There are two types of uh, devices which we use here. One is what we call passive dampers and another is the tuned mass system. So in passive devices, we are dissipating the energy either through friction or yielding or viscosity of the material. So passive dampers, again, are of two types, displacement dependent devices, where the energy dissipation depends on the displacement or it takes place due to displacement and the velocity dependent devices in which the energy dissipation is taking place due to velocity. So if the displacement is occurring very slowly, then these uh, uh, these uh, devices are not working. But if there is a velocity, higher the velocity, more resistance and more energy dissipation takes place in these devices. So these displacement based devices are either friction type of dampers. So whenever there is sliding at a surface, due to friction, there is energy dissipation or metallic yielding dev devices. So there we have metallic components and uh, metals have this property that these yield at certain level of stress and yielding means that these can flow. So these metals will undergo deformations without any increase in the forces. So that phenomena we utilize for developing hysteresis and energy dissipation. Uh, in case of metallic dampers. Then velocity control or uh, velocity dependent devices are again two types. The most commonly used devices are these fluid viscous dampers. So fluid viscous dampers work on the principle of viscosity. So when a fluid flows at high velocity due to the viscosity of the fluid there is a force generated and that force uh, because of the velocity causes uh, dissipation of energy. So uh, generally we have a piston and cylinder system. The piston is having a viscous fluid. Uh, sorry, the cylinder is having a viscous fluid and the piston is having an orifice. And when the piston is moving inside that fluid, uh, then the fluid undergoes a high velocity through that orifice. And as a result, it dissipates energy. When we say it dissipates energy, actually it converts the energy into a different form. That is the heat. And uh, you might have seen this in case of uh, shock absorbers of a vehicle, a bike. And if you run it for some time, then you can see that the uh, shock absorbers become hot because whatever vibration energy is transmitted from the wheels, that gets converted into heat. Similar concept we are using in dissipating earthquake energy. So whatever energy earthquake is imparting to the structure, we dissipate that, we change it in the form of heat energy through these viscous dampers. Another type of dampers are the viscoelastic dampers, as the name suggests. In addition to viscosity, these dampers are also having elasticity. So uh, these are also forming a loop, a sterotic loop. And due to that formation of a sterotic loop, energy dissipation takes place. In tuned mass dampers, two type of uh, dampers we use, tuned mass dampers and tuned liquid dampers. So tuned mass dampers, these work on the principle that the energy imparted by the structure or by the earthquake to the structure is absorbed by these tuned mass dampers. And these tuned mass dampers, these are subjected to vibrations. So vibrations of the main structure are controlled and the energy is transmitted to the secondary system. And the secondary system uh, is designed to dissipate that energy. 
In tuned liquid dampers, the same action is done by liquid. So we know a column of liquid is also having uh, a frequency of vibration or a period of vibration. And if that period of vibration matches with the period of the structure, the energy will be transmitted to that liquid. And the liquid can dissipate that energy. And the structure is safe from dissipating that energy and uh, getting damaged during that. So the simplest type of energy dissipation device which we can think of is a friction damper. So what you see in this figure, it is a sliding brace type friction damper. So here there are two surfaces and those two surfaces are uh, connected to each other through boards by applying a controlled friction. And this controlled friction, uh, it has certain sliding force value. And as the force in the brace reaches that value, the sliding will occur. And when the sliding is occurring, it will develop a stresses and the energy will be dissipated depending upon the uh, area of that steretic loop. So here we can simply provide this along a diagonal of the frame system. Now this uh, can be modified or this has been modified in this form known as uh, the patented devices PAL dampers. So here much smaller size of the bracing is used because this is designed in such a way that the bracing remains in tension. Whereas in the first case, which I just explained, the bracing goes into compression. So size of the bracing has to be sufficient so that it does not buckle under compression. But this device is developed in such a way that the bracing is in tension. And we know steel can take, any metal can take much more force in tension. So much smaller size of the bracing is adequate. And this arrangement of the strips here in the uh, inside this damper, it's such that when one diagonal is elongated, the other diagonal get compressed automatically. And due to that, the tension is transferred to the other diagonal also. Otherwise, uh, in case of normal braces, when the earthquake is applied or the displacement is applied in one direction, one diagonal will be in compression and the other diagonal will be in tension. So that diagonal which will be in compression is prone to buckling. So that can be avoided with this type of device. Another type of device which dissipates energy through rotation. So when it is having frictional rotation, so at these bolts, the rotation takes place between these plates and when the rotation is occurring and there is a normal force applied at the two surfaces here through these boards, it will dissipate energy through friction. So the idea is that we are not providing or we are not uh, forced to provide a lot of material in the bracing. Uh, we have to just provide sufficient size so that this force can be transmitted through tension to this damper and the damper is dissipating the energy. Now this is the typical hysteretic loop which we achieve through friction. So we can see that the friction depends upon many things. It does not remain constant. It also depends to some extent by the velocity. But in general, we can see that there is a rectangular hysteretic loop. And based on the size of this loop, the energy per cycle, energy dissipated per cycle, we can compute. And that energy dissipated per cycle is responsible or uh, it is equivalent to the energy or uh, to the damping because damping also is a major of energy dissipation and different types of devices have different types of hysteretic loop. The idea is to maximize the area of this hysteretic loop so that larger energy can be dissipated per cycle. The other type of dampers which I was discussing based on yielding. So one type of dampers are where we have these plates cut in the into the size uh, of dumbbells in such a way that there is a smaller cross section in the middle. So when it will be subjected to shear force uh, because of the movement of the beam with respect to this brace. So it will be subjected to large stresses at this neck and it is going to yield at the neck. And due to that yielding, the stresses will be formed and energy dissipation will take place due to that hysteresis. Another energy dissipation device is in the form of this steel plate. This steel plate is subjected to shear. And to avoid shear buckling, uh, these stiffeners, horizontal and vertical stiffeners are provided. And when it is subjected to deformation like the one which is shown here, this will be subjected to uh, shear deformation. And due to that shear deformation, again, 
it will be uh, developing a static loop and uh, energy dissipation will take place. Different forms, different shapes of metals are used, have been used in different types of uh, devices. So a variety of devices is available. Idea is that somehow we have to yield the metal and that metal yielding should take place before damage of any other component of the structure including the connection with these devices and due to that yielding of the metal in all these cases energy dissipation will take place one such approach is what is shown here which we call brb buckling restrain bracing so in buckling restrain bracing the brace is used and the size of the brace you can see this plate inside this is the core or the actual brace and it is encased into a casing another steel tube and between this outer steel tube and the inner plate a material which is minimizing the friction is used a lubricating uh, material is also used and as a result what happens when this uh, brace or this core is subjected to tension it will yield but when it is subjected to compression again it will yield but it will be prone to buckling and this outer core which is not in contact direct contact with this brace this will not be subjected to any compressive force and as a result this is not going to buckle and it will protect the inner core against buckling so that's how we can dissipate energy uh, through compression but yielding as well as uh, tension yielding avoiding buckling because buck when buckling is there uh, then the premature failure occurs and we cannot get a stable hysteretic loop. So in all these yielding type of energy devices, this is the hysteretic loop. And uh, this size of the hysteretic loop will depend upon the force at which the yielding is taking place and the maximum displacement. So if we increase the force or we increase the maximum displacement, the energy dissipation capacity will increase. But when we are increasing the force, we have to keep in mind that the reaction to that force will be applied on the structure. So the structural components which are directly connected to these uh, devices, those structural components also need to be strengthened. So that we have to keep in mind. The other commonly used uh, damping device which I was talking, uh, which is working on the viscosity of fluid. So this is fluid viscous dampers. And here, as I explained that we have a piston and cylinder arrangement and a fluid is filled, a viscous fluid is filled and when it is moving, the fluid is dissipating energy and it is converting the energy into the heat. So this type of devices are also commonly used in buildings and bridges. The advantage of this type of uh, devices is that these are the velocity uh, sensitive devices and the energy dissipation or the force, resistance force generated here is proportional to the velocity and when a structure is subjected to vibration the displacement and velocity are at a phase difference of 90 degrees that means when the displacement is maximum the velocity will be zero and when the velocity is maximum displacement will be zero so that avoids application of additional forces which i have explained previously in case of uh, friction and metallic devices that if we are increasing the sliding force or the yielding force in those devices i can dissipate more energy but at the same time the force applied on the structure will also increase in this case the force applied on the structure is not acting in the same phase as the other forces are acting and that is why that problem is avoided in this type of dampers and these are more common than other types of dampers. Another uh, improvement in this type of damper is what we call wall type of dampers, viscous fluid dampers. So here this is a wall, actually it is like a tank, a thin tank in which fluid is filled and there is another wall which is hanging into it and when this top wall is moving inside this fluid because of the viscosity of the fluid, it is dissipating energy. So this is also not adding any stiffness to the structure. And uh, here also the forces are at a phase difference of 90 degree from the displacement. The forces due to uh, 
viscosity or at a 90 degree phase difference and we get the same effect as we are getting from piston cylinder arrangement. So if I show you the force displacement plot of a viscous damper, it is like this what is shown in the left figure. So when the displacement is zero, the velocity is maximum and hence we get the maximum force. At the peak displacement, the velocity became uh, zero and as a result, the force becomes zero. So this is the hysteretic loop we are getting in case of a viscous damper. Now, uh, the viscous damper does not have only viscosity, it also has some stiffness. So if we consider that stiffness, uh, stiffness of the uh, piston, stiffness of the uh, bracing elements which are connecting the damper to the structure, due to that stiffness, we will get combined effect of stiffness and viscosity like what is shown here. And the energy dissipated per cycle is equal to the area of the hysteretic loop. So larger the area of the hysteretic loop, more energy this device can dissipate. So uh, this is how the viscous force varies with displacement and velocity. And here the variation with frequency is also given. So it is also a frequency dependent device because larger frequency means for the same displacement, larger velocity is generated. And when we are generating larger velocity, larger force and larger energy dissipation will take place. Now these dampers, whether these are uh, friction type or yield type or uh, viscous fluid dampers, these can be converted into equivalent damping. And uh, that equivalent damping is dependent upon the area of the sterilitic loop. So here if I calculate this area of the sterilitic loop, one single loop, then if this area is AH, then this can be calculated as this equivalent damping can be calculated as 1 upon 2 pi AH over K effective delta square, where delta is this maximum displacement which is occurring, and K effective is this stiffness when joining origin with the maximum displacement point. So, if I join that by a linear system, then uh, this formula gives me the damping, equivalent damping of this device and uh, this damping I can simply use in developing the reduced response spectrum and using that response uh, reduced response spectrum I can approximately calculate uh, the displacement of this uh, structure uh, which is subject which is provided with uh, these energy dissipation devices. Now uh, Professor Matsagar explained that there is a code available for uh, base isolation devices but similar code for damping devices is yet not available. I hope in future it will come. But AC7 and also AC41, they provide detailed guidelines about designing of damping devices. And one important thing uh, regarding these devices, and actually it is also applicable for uh, base isolators, that these devices are not meant to economize the structure. So if we are looking from the economy point of view, then that will be unfair with these devices. These devices are actually provided for enhanced performance. So if we have an important structure like a hospital, which we want to remain operational during earthquake, then these devices are the solution. So we can design our hospitals with conventional ways also by increasing the size of beams and columns and shear walls and uh, it is governed by IS 1893 and also NDMA uh, guidelines for hospital buildings. So in NDMA guidelines for hospital buildings, it is clear that we will design our structure for MC. Rest of the structures we are designing for DV, but hospitals we have to design for DVE so that those are operational even during the maximum considered earthquake. So what AC7 says that if you are designing a building with energy dissipation devices, you can reduce the design base shear up to 75% of the one without damping devices. So only 25% reduction in the base shear you can take. So it is not a big uh, gain in terms of economy. But with this design, we will be able to achieve a uh, performance level in which the structure will remain elastic. So the idea is that our structure should remain elastic during DBE and under MC, it should undergo very limited, uh, very limited yielding. 
so that there is no visible damage and the structure continues to perform even under MC. So this is important that you have to design the structure alone without dampers also for 75% of the base shear, usual base shear for which you have been designing. You would have otherwise designed uh, this structure. So when we are uh, designing uh, buildings with uh, energy dissipation devices, what we have to keep in mind that there is up to 25% reduction available. But if the building is having some irregularities, then it will be designed for full base shear. So the design will take place for the full base shear. The damper will be in addition to that. And the purpose of providing dampers is to enhance the performance because the conventional structure, even if it is designed for full base shear, will undergo severe damage. It may be at the verge of collapse under MC. So that performance objective is not uh, acceptable to us in case of important structures. And that's where we are providing these damping devices. So we have to design some cases, the code says, even for the full base shear, which we would have designed our structure even without dampers. So if in the direction of interest, that means in any of the two directions, the damping system has fewer than two damping devices on each floor. So minimum two devices in each direction are to be provided. If we have less than that, then the structure will be designed for full base shear. You are not taking any advantage of those dampers in design base shear. And if the seismic force adjusting system has horizontal or vertical irregularity, and these irregularities are defined in our code, IS-1893, table 5 and 6 defines those irregularities. So if it is any of those irregularities, then also you have to design it for the full uh, base shear. And uh, the damping devices shall be designed to remain elastic during MCE loads. Whereas the structure will be designed for DB load. So our structure can develop some yielding during MC, but the damping devices are not supposed to develop any yielding even under MC loads. So the devices should remain elastic even under MC load. And uh, some of the force control uh, elements so uh, are there always in a structure. So those force control elements will be designed for 20% more force. So the force in the force control systems force control elements will be increased by 20%. So when we are designing uh, these devices to remain elastic under MC load, we have to consider the low cycle and large displacement degradation caused by seismic loads. We have to consider high cycle and small displacement. For example, what is taking place in case of wind because these devices will be effective even during wind. So these will not only be helping us in case of earthquake, these will also be helping in case of wind. And during wind, these will be subjected to a large number of cycles uh, due to wind loading. And we have to consider the fatigue failure of these devices under that type of loading. And during earthquake, there will be a fewer cycles, but the displacement will be much larger. So both these types of uh, fatigue failure, we have to consider while designing these devices and the force or displacement caused due to gravity loads because that will be acting in any case. So we have to design for that also. Now, uh, one problem which can be foreseen in case of devices, especially friction based devices, that uh, with time, these can be, sub because these are metallic devices. So these can be subjected to corrosion or abrasion. And due to this corrosion, uh, there is a possibility that the two devices uh, or the two plates in the friction device can uh, got uh, adhered to each other. There can be addition between them. And due to that, the device will not be able to slide during earthquake. So this is a major issue. Whenever we are providing a friction-based device, we have to be careful about the corrosion life of that structure. If there is an onset of the corrosion, the device needs to be replaced. So the device should be suitably designed and protected against uh, corrosion and then other environmental conditions like temperature, humidity, moisture, radiations, what effect it has on the damping devices. That also we have to keep in mind while using 
uh, the damping devices. Now, uh, even with uh, properly designed and manufactured devices, there can be a variation in the properties. So that variation in the properties we have to take into account and two upper bound and lower bound sets of properties we have to use. The upper bound set will have the friction about 1.2 times or the capacity of the device 1.2 times and the lower bound set of the properties will have 0.85 times of the design property. So we have to design with these values also because forces in some of the connecting members can increase if the capacity of the damping device is more than what we have considered in our design. So we have to consider a 25% increment and a 15% decrement also. Then when we are designing these devices, uh, we have to design these in such a way that these should be able to sustain 130% of the displacement during MC. So we will be designing for MC and that displacement we will increase by 130% because we have to keep in mind earthquakes higher than MC can also occur. So MC is also having a 2% probability of accidents during uh, its lifetime, 50 years. So if higher than MC earthquake is occurring, even then these devices should be functional. So that's why the displacement capacity of 130% of the MC earthquake and similarly the velocity can also be 130% higher than that at, at the MC. So 30% increase in the displacement and velocity beyond MC is to be considered as per SC7. Then uh, we are having some inherent damping in our structure that is combined with the additional damping due to these devices and uh, that inherent damping when we are combining with these devices we have to consider uh, 3%, not 5% but 3%. And the story drift shall be determined using MC ground motions. So it is important that we are considering MC level of earthquake when we are using supplementary devices. Just to illustrate effectivity of uh, effectiveness of these devices, I'm showing uh, a case study. So a generic building here, uh, which is considered as a hospital building. So this building was designed as per code. So code allows a importance factor of 1.5 uh, on the building forces in if in case the building is being designed as hospital, the so importance factor for hospital is 1.5. So in one case, it was designed as per IS 1893 using importance factor 1.5. Another case, it was designed as per NDMA guidelines. And NDMA guidelines ask to design for MC. So rest of the procedure is similar, but the force to be considered is MC. So it was designed for MC. So MC means two times of dV. So, in other words, we can say that importance factor is 2. So, it was designed with an importance factor 1.5 and importance factor of 2. And performance of both the designs was estimated. And it was found that the building is able to achieve immediate occupancy performance level as far as the plastic deformation or the damage in the components is concerned, even under MC, both the buildings designed as per code, that is importance factor of 1.5 and using importance factor of 2 as per NDMA guidelines, in both the cases, immediate occupancy performance level was obtained. Now you can ask if immediate occupancy performance level was already obtained, what is the point in applying base isolation or energy dissipation devices? So the drift and flow acceleration, that also we have to check in case of uh, important buildings like hospital buildings. So FEMA guidelines provide a limit of 1% corresponding to operational buildings like hospital buildings. Interstory drift should not be more than 1%. Although there is no um, limit available for floor acceleration, but the floor acceleration also is to be reduced so that there is no damage to the acceleration sensitive non-structural components. So this is the elevation, two elevations were considered, one four story and another seven story. And as I said, that uh, immediate occupancy performance level was uh, obtained in both the cases. 
four story as well as seven story design as per code design as per uh, ndma guidelines so what you see here and then uh, when we check the interstory drift so we can see that the interstory drift is being accelerated so this a is the four story uh, building without damper and this is seven story sorry four story building without damper and this is the building design as per ndma guidelines so as i said that ndma guidelines are asking for an importance factor of 2 so this building is designed for higher force so you can see its interstory drift at mc is less but it's still this is also exceeding 1% but when we provide dampers with them the interstory drift is reduced significantly it is uh, very clearly uh, much well within the limit of 1% now same thing is applicable to seven story uh, building in case of seven story building when uh, uh, the dampers were not provided these were exceeding the limit in case of uh, ndma guidelines when seven story building is designed it is just at the limit but when we provided dampers the interstory drift reduced significantly now this is showing the peak floor acceleration so this red and green curves these are representing the peak floor acceleration in case of buildings conventional buildings without dampers and this black and blue these are representing with dampers so you can see that not only interstory drift the peak floor acceleration has also reduced to less than half here it is close to 0.35 and here it is close to 2 so the peak floor acceleration has also reduced significantly this is in case of four story building and this is in case of seven story building so to conclude with dampers not only the structural performance improves more importantly the performance of non structural components both acceleration sensitive components as well as drift sensitive components is also improved significantly and uh, this is essential for operational performance level of important buildings like hospitals thank you and uh, just to show you uh, how there that there is not only reduction in uh, the acceleration uh, peak floor acceleration the amplification corresponding to the period of the building is also reduced significantly so this is uh, the uh, floor response spectrum when damper is not used here when the damper is used okay so thank you over to you uh, mr mitra thank you uh, thank you so much sir for the wonderful presentation and i think uh, you took us uh, right from the basics and fundamentals of earthquake to the concept of earthquake resistant design and then the basics of energy dissipations and you created also that wonderful analogy with our vehicles which we also uh, operate on a daily basis to create a uh, clear understanding i mean the types of dampers the principles of and their uses are also essential um uh, yes uh, i think we don't have as of now a standard on uh this dampers but uh, reference to ac7 and ac41 can be made for the purpose and uh, the reference to ndma guideline i think sir it's a very important uh, document and uh, people should ideally uh, refer to it whenever we are designing for hospital buildings it's a very comprehensive uh, guideline which is uh, prepared for design of hospitals and uh, uh, you're right in mentioning that uh, we sometimes get into the discussion of uh, whether this method is very costly or whether a conventional method is economically more effective but uh, the intent is never to achieve that uh, economy but to increase the enhance the performance and if we are able to do that then going forward in the long term or even in the during the service life of the structure we can minimize a lot of damage that actually is an indirect uh, translation into saving of uh, assets and uh, saving of uh, money and the case study i think with hospital building it clearly shows the difference that can be obtained and uh, i think overall it was a very enlightening session sir i i can just thank you for this and uh, if you also see the chat i think uh, people are really appreciating your and masagar's uh, sessions i could see one question in the chat box and uh, maybe if you would like to uh, touch base upon that is that yes is one of those questions was that base isolation does it turn out to be economical than dampers i think uh, maybe not the right aspect to it but it's a very 
wrong comparison to do. <laughs> but anything you would like to add to it, and then I can move to the second question, which I also see in the question. Actually, uh, it will vary depending on uh, the uh, local site conditions. So, in some cases, uh, the base isolation will be the solution. I'm not. I'm intentionally not using the word economical. So. Uh, we have to look, economy is just one aspect. We have to look at the performance also. So in some cases, base isolation is a more suitable solution. In some cases, the damping device may be the more suitable solution. Uh, usually for tall buildings, again, I'm saying usually. Usually for tall buildings, the dampers are considered to be more suitable. And for low rise buildings, base isolation is a uh, more suitable solution. Uh, sir, uh, thank you so much, sir. The second question is that this uh, from uh, Dhara Shah, I think from CEPT, does this 130% capacity of devices hold true as per the draft CD39 as well as in the draft as per the building category for strength and serviceability, time return periods are different? Yeah, so as I said that currently our CD39 is does not have any guideline on damping devices and this 130 percent on in case of damping devices and for that matter uh, in case of any device is from a different consideration because we even if we are designing for mc mc is the largest force cur currently we are considering in our design so the longest return period so even when we are designing for mc there is still a possibility that that may also be exceeded and when it is happening in our conventional structure we have ductility to absorb that but when we are depending on a device, and, and the, in that case, if the device fails, then we do not have any line of difference. So that's why in case of devices, when we are using any mechanical device, so in that case, some over capacity, over and above MC is also desired. That's how this 130% is coming. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I think, uh, and... Uh... Dharash, if I you're able to other also... questions are related to Professor Matsagar. Actually, I request you uh, to grant me leave because there is another. Yeah. So sure, sir. And I think we and... have also covered all the questions. And if there is anything unanswered, then we can also. Sure, I will be happy. So please please uh, just send me an email. I will be happy to apply. Perfect, sir. Okay, and uh, thank you so much. Mat Sagar. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, joining and uh, thank you, Matsagar, sir. Also, I know it's early in the morning. You are nine and a half hours behind India time. But uh, yeah. thank you for joining uh, on this uh, call. And uh, with this, I, I like to bring an end to the session. I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion and it was a very insightful session over the last one and a half hours. Uh, we stretched a little bit, but I think that was worth doing with a lot of insights. So thank you again for a patient listening and uh, thank you, Dr. Matsagar. And, uh, Wish you a great day and a happy weekend ahead. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.